Technology here at Mona. Welcome to the inaugural professorial lecture by Professor Charles Grant of the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences. Whether you're joining us from right here in Jamaica, from another Caribbean island, or somewhere else in the world, we are so pleased that you have decided to spend a bit of your time with us this afternoon. I'm especially pleased that Professor Grant accepted the invitation to deliver this lecture, as nuclear science is not a typical topic of discussion in many circles. With his promotion to the rank of professor, we seized the opportunity to hear and learn a bit about Professor Grant's academic interests. There is much that can be said about Professor Grant, and we certainly will hear a bit more about him, but just not from me. That's because joining me today is another member of our faculty's family. That's Professor Emeritus Ishin Kumba Kawa. Professor Kawa will introduce and tell you a bit more about Professor Grant. But before he does, let me tell you a little about our Professor Kawa. Prof Kawa had conducted extensive research in the area of supramolecular chemistry and hazardous materials, especially asbestos. Having served the UWI for 31 years, he officially concluded his time here in September 2018. During his time at the UE, he served as head of the Department of Chemistry, Dean of All Faculty, and Deputy Principal, all here at the Mona campus. Although time does not permit me to share with you Prof Kawa's numerous noteworthy achievements, just a few of them are that he was a member of the campus's strategic transformation team that developed strategies for improving scholarly output. He led efforts to establish the engineering programs at Mona, along with other collaborators, established the occupational and environmental safety and health programs, has served or serves on several boards, including that of the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences, of which Prof Grant is a part. <clears throat> He's received several awards, including the Order of Distinction, Commander Class, the Gleaner Award for Science and Technology, and the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research and Public Services. He's a member of the CARICOM Science, Technology, and Innovation Committee, and has been a referee for several international journals and a member of a team helping the African Union establish a five campus continental university, the Pan African University. So, Professor Kawa, thanks very much again for joining us this afternoon, and welcome to you and to our guest of honor, Professor Charles Grant. I hand the mic over to you now, Prof Kawa. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dean. Uh, and good afternoon to um, all of us who are listening uh, to this uh, uh, highly accomplished uh, colleague, uh, Professor Charles Grant. Uh, I have known Professor Grant for, uh, quite, um, uh, for quite some time, and there is quite a lot to be said uh, about him. Uh, but let me say that um, uh, he's he was born in the United Kingdom, and he did much of his schooling all the way from the um, uh, early, chi early childhood education uh, to a master's level, you know, in England. Um, and he specialized in, um, is, is an engineer uh, with a specialty uh, in nuclear uh, uh, physics, uh, nuclear engineering. So, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Charles Grant is a nuclear physicist uh, who has prax practiced his craft at the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences, uh, UWI, uh, from where he can actually be credited with a huge um, a global reputation in the application of atomic energy uh, to human development in such areas as human health, agriculture, uh, and many more, and impacted uh, the Caribbean small island states um, and uh, well beyond those. Uh, he's a, a, a very much sought after expert for International Atomic Energy Agency. There is a huge reputation you walk in the corridors of the International Atomic Energy Agency and you mention Charles Grant's name and you see people smile. Uh, say, they say you have a very good man uh, there in Jamaica. And Jamaica has benefited quite a lot from that reputation you know, that, uh, uh, that, 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 that he has built and also several other countries, as I will mention to you, uh, in, um, you know, quite shortly. At the UWI, he, has in, he was, um, I'll just mention some of the major uh, 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 
uh, projects that he has, uh, uh, he has had a, a major uh, contribution to. Uh, he was in charge of the, uh, of, um, of the conversion of ISIS highly enriched uranium source, which, uh, which um, the Americans and others were worried uh, could uh, form a basis for a dirty bomb. Uh, and so, the, um, so there was a need to change it from highly enriched uranium to a low enriched uranium, which is not good for a nuclear bomb. And so Charles was, uh, uh, was in charge of that. And that really cost us uh, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion uh, you know, Jamaican dollars. In so doing, uh, the confidence that the international community uh, built about Jamaica's capacity to safely and securely use atomic energy for development was enhanced uh, enormously uh, by, uh, by, by, by that successful um, activity. And subsequently, uh, we negotiated with the um, International Atomic Energy Agency uh, for Jamaica to get an irradiation source uh, to sterilize mosquitoes um, and uh, uh, sterilize fruits and fresh produce, uh, which are meant for export on the international market, and uh, also negotiated successfully uh, uh, on the basis of the confidence that he had built in matters nuclear for the reintroduction of nuclear medicine in Jamaica, uh, which was, uh, uh, had stopped uh, at some point. So as you can see, the international community has enormous um, uh, confidence uh, in Charles, uh, Charles' ability uh, to guide us uh, in the area of nuclear uh, and radiation uh, safety. Not only has he been um, useful to, uh, to Jamaica and the UWI, uh, but uh, Charles was uh, 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 drafted by the International Atomic Energy Agency to write the regional strategic profiles um, in the area of nuclear and radiation safety uh, for, the, for the Caribbean, 20, the 2016 you know, uh, uh, project. Uh, this he, he did uh, quite successfully in 2018. Uh, he also provided, um, has been providing uh, technical advice and co-authored the initial draft of the country program framework for Jamaica um, and also for, uh, the, um, uh, for, for, for Antigua and Barbuda, Bahamas, um, Barbados, Belize, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Guyana, St. Vincent and Grenadines, Grenadines, and all of that done in 20, between 2018 and 2019. And he has also uh, provided um, a consultation for uh, the government of the Cayman Islands uh, uh, when they had a, a health problem associated with arsenic, you know, there. And internationally now, he, has, um, uh, he was uh, again uh, uh, asked by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, to, to head a delegation to Bolivia uh, to help them to um, uh, to, to organize the nuclear uh, science uh, 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 business there uh, in preparation for establishing uh, a nuclear reactor. And he was also uh, part of it. Uh, was, he led the team. Uh, he was part of the four uh, person experts, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, sent to Ghana uh, to look at the integrated safety as, um, uh, of their, uh, of their re research reactor you know, there. And he did the same thing. Uh, for Abuja, sorry, for Nigeria uh, in 2019. He has been pretty active um, or, um, in transformative uh, uh, advisory services uh, in Jamaica, advising uh, the government on the need to uh, include atomic energy in, it, in its energy mix and um, uh, uh, advising and actually helping the country in dealing with its uh, uh, hazardous uh, chemicals uh, uh, stockpiles, uh, which um, and and some of that and some of those of that stockpile has already been reduced uh, through uh, disposal um, uh, and and so on. So I could go on and on, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, it suffices to say uh, that um, Ch uh, uh, Professor Charles Grant has been a huge blessing uh, for the Caribbean, for the universe of the West Indies and the world, uh, indeed. As I indicated earlier, uh, Jamaica. United, the University of the West Indies, Jamaica, the Caribbean, uh, the uh, many developing uh, uh, countries, and in fact, the uh, uh, total functioning of the International Atomic Energy Agency on this part of the world uh, does it, has it depended quite much uh, on the expertise, dedication, and insights uh, that Charles 
has had uh, in the area of uh, nuclear and, and radiation uh, and radiation safety. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you uh, Professor Charles Grant uh, to give his inaugural lecture uh, to this afternoon. Good afternoon, family, friends, colleagues, and well wishers. Professor Kawa, thank you for that glowing introduction. Very much appreciated, especially coming from someone as accomplished as yourself. So let me move on to the, the matters of the day. Let me start by thanking some very special people in my life. My mother, Myrtle Grant, Nee Brown. My father, sadly, no longer with us. My wife, if it wasn't for her, as you will hear shortly, I would not be at UWE today. My children for their unconditional love and support. My siblings, especially my sister Paulette and brother Johnny, who managed to keep me on the straight and narrow during the young days and always provided positive um, encouragement for me. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Professor Denise Eldemeyer Shearer, who insisted that I start the process for a professorship. Every time I saw her, she would ask, you put your resume together yet? So if it wasn't for her, I would not have considered taking this path at all. I'd also like to thank Professor Marcia Roy, who encouraged me to participate in the VC award system for 2020. And I, I was successful there, but I won't say too much about that. So this is the overview of my presentation. I will share a little bit about my journey to the UWI the institution that I worked at and now head, the research fields that I joined and that we undertook, and their relationships to three important social, social um, sustainable development goals, or socioeconomic de development goals, um, those being number two, zero hunger, SDG number three, health and well-being, and SDG number nine, industry, infrastructure and commerce. I'll also discuss with you my activities after becoming DG, and finally share with you my vision of the future of the institution and my career possibly, and the role it will play in achieving Jamaica's National Development Plan 2030 and the associated um, United Nations SDGs. So these are my elders. This is where it began. Top left are Charles and Nettie Brown, my mother's parents, my mother, Myrtle Brown, the young, younger version of her. My daughter looks exactly like her. Um, next are my mother and father on their return to Jamaica in 1990, almost 50 odd years after they had left the island. Far right is my, the young version of my father. And to the bottom right are my grandparents on my father's side, James and Arabella Grant. So my parents are part of what is now known as the Windrush Generation. That name, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, it's been in the news for all the wrong reasons. They actually went up to England in the 19, early 1950s. But like I said, the Windrush generation now, um, all the wrong reasons for being in the news, particularly about the poor treatment meted out to a number of persons who were in the UK for over 60 years and then were having their rights removed. I had to say something about it. it's a terrible situation, but I'll leave it right there. This is not a political forum. So this is where it all began, September 30, 1966 at Lewisham Hospital. Top left are photo of my siblings and one cousin. So going from left to right, top row first, my cousin Trevor, um, elder sister Claudette, in the middle, my brother Fitzroy, elder sister um, Paulette, bottom row, that's my brother Johnny, and my to, to my right, that's me in the center, um, my elder brother Tony. I'm the youngest of the bunch, so just to give you an idea. So bottom left is a typical picture or where I grew up in um, Brockley, South East London back in the 70s. So shown here is a brief map of my academic career. Started in 1973 at John Stainer Primary School, which happened to be the first year I actually came to Jamaica. I started high school at Samuel Peach in 1978 and then university in 1986. My first degree was in applied um, physics at the University of Surrey with, one, with a one-year study work program in Stuttgart, West Germany, as it was then, 
where I worked as part of a team on microchip designs with a company called Standard Electric Lorenz. You will now recognize that company as Alka told the name change they were bought out. So upon completion of my first degree, I worked in the city of London for a while as a property accountant, a job courtesy of my big sis Paulette, who arranged everything for me. Um, but quickly realized that that wasn't for me and that's not what I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. I reached out to my old professor, Nicholas Spiro at University of Surrey. He arranged for me to start my master's in radiation and environmental protection um, with a specialization in reactor physics that following year, so that would be 91. So I graduated in 92 and I came to visit my parents in Jamaica that Christmas. I hadn't seen them for two years. As I said, they'd almost left home for 50 years and were glad to be back in 1990. So as young men do, I met a young lady. We hit it off immediately. However, it was a bittersweet time as I was convinced that there was no future for me here in Jamaica. After all, I had specialized in reactor physics and was certain that there was no such piece in Jamaica. She said to me she was sure they had one of those things up at the UWI. She'd seen it on profile or something the following Sunday. She insisted on me putting my resume together and sent it off to the UWI. About a month later, I received a call from Prof Layla, um, who was then the principal of the Mona campus, um, to come in for an interview. She, of course, was correct, as they did indeed have a reactor on campus. Now, unbeknownst to me, Prof Layla and my old professor, Nicholas Peru, um, were good old friends. The nuclear community is a small, is a small one. So during the interview in his office, he called Nicholas at home and said, Nick, I have one of your boys here, Charles Grant. He claims he wants to work for me. What do you think of him? And the response was, well, if you don't want him, I'll take him back. So I took, that was a glowing reference as far as I was concerned, short and sweet. Oh, sorry, I missed my slide. So about the institution, well, I started work at the Center for Nuclear Sciences, as it was called at the time. It was a small but highly dedicated research unit. Now, as you can see by the names, and these are the colleagues of the team that I joined at the time, um, all the researchers um, were basically chemists, including Prof. Layla, the only exception being um, Dr. Butchkoff, now Prof. Butchkoff. So I brought a slightly different flavor to the team in that not only was a physicist, but with a speciality in reactor physics. And a time shortly after that, Prof. Layla actually made me the first chief reactor operator for the facility. So now you know how I got here and you know a little bit about the institution that I joined and that I worked at. However, a good question would be, what does nuclear science have to do with sustainable development issues of agriculture, health and environmental sciences? And by the end of my talk, I hope it will make a little more sense to you as to why I'm here and why I started. Well, I have to go back a little bit. Um, I am going to apologize to my colleagues in chemistry because I had spoken quite a bit about this during the memorial lecture for the late Prof Layla earlier this year in chemistry. So, um, but for the other person, I, I will give you a little detail. So it starts like this. During a study tour of the Soviet Union in 1974 and East Germany in, um, at the same time, um, both of which don't exist anymore, although I see Vladimir Putin making a good attempt to bring the Soviet Union back to life. Prof. Leila came across a very powerful analytical technique known as neutron activation analysis, which had been used extensively in several large-scale geochemical mapping exercises in the Soviet Union, leading to the discovery of one of the world's largest deposits of tungsten. He immediately thought such an exercise in Jamaica could have a profound effect for science in the country. Just one small problem, he needed an intense source of neutrons in the form of a reactor. He was so sure that this was the right path that several years later, he was able to convince the European Union to spend their money on a Canadian reactor. Now, I'm not sure, for those of you familiar with fundraising, you know that that, that never happens. They spend money with their own countrymen. Unbelievable as it was, he got it done, but that was the kind of person Prof. Lena was.
So as I said to you, the React is of Canadian design. It was named a Slowpoke. Um, it's an, actually an acronym. Acronym stands for Safe Low Power Critical Experiment. There were only eight other commercial units ever made, and we are the only one outside of Canada. Now, all the others that you see in red have been shut down and decommissioned. They no longer exist. However, it's not quite as lonely as it sounds. Um, so on this map here, you will see the three green dots representing the location of the remaining slow poles. But also, you will note um, eight red dots. These are the miniature neutron source reactors. This is the Chinese version of the reactor. So the analytical techniques and methodologies that we developed here and that I will share with you are also applicable to this class of reactor. So, sorry, the clicker is a bit slow. So just a, a brief um, description of the reactor. So the only takeaway I want you to take from this slide, I mean, it's a lot of numbers and so on, is that it's a compact core. It's 93% enriched in uranium-235, keeping in mind that naturally occurring uranium is only 0.7% um, enriched in uranium-235. However, as Prof Kawa had hinted at, post 9 11 the use of highly enriched uranium weapons grade material became a real issue one which i had to solve later on also on this slide or also to take keep in mind this reactor is inherently safe it only has one single um, control rod a cadmium control rod the beauty of this re reactor is that it has a large negative temperature coefficient in layman's terms the hotter the reactor gets the less efficient it becomes so the, the possibility of the reactor melting down does not exist. As the reactor reaches a certain temperature, it actually shuts itself down. And that is one of the tests you do when you start the reactor for the very first time. Um, so we know that we're safe with it in this configuration. So you know the reactor, the institution. Well, the reactor started, or the Center for Nuclear Sciences was opened in 1984. The reactor came to life in, on the 13th of March of that year. Um, it's used primarily for neutron activation analysis, teaching, and education. Now, later on, in 1997 or so, the government of Jamaica signed a, a, an agreement to join a network of laboratories around the world called ComSat. It was to encourage self-self collaborations in, in science and technology. At that point, the Center for Nuclear Sciences was selected to be one of 10 nodes around the world. And we, we were then renamed the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences. And at that time, we became a joint venture between the government of Jamaica and the UWI. Um, particularly with the government, we're under the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology, Honorable Minister Vars being our head. <coughs> oh, I, sorry about that. So this is the slide that I should have been showing you. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the um, institution, to the left, that's UWI. Um, bottom right is the actual um, facility. So how do we move from understanding the fate of neutrons inside of a reactor to understanding the fate of trace elements in the biosphere? So how do we move from what's in rocks to soil, to water, to air, to food, to animals, and eventually you? We want to understand the entire chain, how this thing all hangs together. Now, for the reactor, the process that takes place inside the reactor is called fission, the splitting of atoms. In our case, uranium-235. A neutron strikes a uranium atom, splits it into two smaller nuclei, as depicted in the top left there. And with the production and of two to three neutrons and the release of energy, that release of energy captured in Einstein's famous equation e equals mc squared. These three neutrons, as again shown in the diagram up, up above, split three more uranium atoms, releasing more energy and more neutrons, so on and so on, a chain reaction. Now, the overall behavior of a chain reaction depends on the multiplication factor. In simple terms, it's the number of fissions in one generation over the number of fissions in the preceding generation. This is captured bottom left in the so-called six-factor formula that takes into account all the less losses and generation points. If K is greater than one, the chain reaction grows rapidly and can lead to things you don't want. 
Uh, if k is less than one, the chain reaction is not sustained. And if k is equal to one, um, the process is maintained. The way we have our reactor set and most research reactors, k is just above one. In, in, in fact, our k is 1.0004. So just enough to keep things going. So how do we use neutrons to understand the fate of trace metals in the biosphere? And I know you all know the answer already. It's, of course, neutron activation analysis. So one technique to achieve everything. Well, almost a bit of an exaggeration. Well, the process of nuclear activation was discovered by Nobel laureate Irene Joliet Curie and her husband, Frederick. Now, I know most of you recognize the name Curie, of course. She is the daughter of double Nobel laureate Madame Curie. What an amazing family of female scientists. So what are the basic principles of NAA? That is, a nucleus will absorb a neutron to produce a characteristic radionuclide that usually emits gamma rays. We then computerize the signal of data and use data reduction techniques to collect the gamma ray spectra, which allows us to identify and quantify these elements with great sensitivity. So let me just walk you through that diagram. So as you see here, we have a neutron being introduced to the target nucleus, um, as shown. That target nucleus is any atom within your sample. Now your sample can be rock, soil, air filters, human tissue, plant material, you name it. If we can get it into the reactor, which is not as complicated as it sounds, we can perform activation analysis. This then goes on to form a compound nucleus, which is incredibly unstable. Keep in mind that this is actually happening inside the reactor. This results in the emission of either alpha particles, beta particles, positrons, and a gamma ray. All this happens spontaneously. Coming out of this now, and this is where, this is the process that actually allows activation analysis to take place. We form a semi-stable radioactive um, nucleus. This semi-stable state is what allows us to remove the sample from the reactor to our measurement device. Now, encircled in green there, you see the um, delayed gamma ray. That gamma ray has all the information we need to know about the target nucleus. So we'll be able to tell you lots of things about the actual sample by just measuring that. Okay. So. How do we then interpret this gamma ray? Well, the above equation, and, and, I'm, and I should apologize, but I'm not going to. I'm a physicist, so you must expect that I would have to show you a couple of equations, but it's, it's key. So the above equation is known as a single shot neutron activation equation, and it's the basic equation used for the determination of elemental concentrations in irradiated samples. So it's not as bad as you think when you break down the equation. So we have a number of universal constants on the left. So these are things that are well known, they're documented, they're in books, they're in published papers. We know them pretty well by now. In the middle and in circle, we have five quantities to measure. Not so bad when you think about it. Three of them are time. So what do you need for that? A stopwatch, right? We need to know how long we irradiated sample for in the reactor how long we're going to count it for on our detection system, and what was the transfer time between the reactor to the counting system. And one of the other things to measure, of course, is mass, like I said, quite simple. Um, just the microbalance, right? The one thing to quantify is D, the detector response, but that also is not as complicated as it sounds, and I will show you um, how we deal with that shortly. So two things on the right that we have to determine. One, how many neutrons are bombarded my sample? That is a quantity known as effluence or neutron flux, and it's measured in neutrons per centimeter squared per second. In our case, in the slow pole, that is a million, million neutrons per centimeter squared flying through your sample. So you know there is gonna be a certain amount of absorption taking place. The other thing is the detector efficiency. How well can we measure these gamma rays that are coming from our sample and to relate, make all the corrections that I needed to come up with a, a use, usable answer? Well, one way of simplifying this thing again, 
is that we can do comparative analysis. So imagine we irradiate something that we know everything about. We know every concentration of every element in it. If we measure it and then do this exact same thing with our unknown sample, we can compare them. So if your peak of gold, so to speak, coming off your known sample, which may have 10 micrograms per kilogram in it, is twice as large as the sample, the unknown sample, then that means you have five micrograms per kilogram in your unknown. So again, we can cancel out not knowing the flux and not knowing the detector efficiency. But at Iceland, we're a little better than that. So, based, because of the remarkable stability of the slowpoke reactors, they're incredible. There are not many reactors like this in the world. The flux, or the number of neutrons per centimeter squared per second, remains constant for a period of years. We, we, and even between reactors. Based on this, we are now able to develop quantification constants for each of the elements. We measure very precisely known amounts of each of the substances that we're interested in and can develop a, a, a constant that can convert the peak area into a concentration. So a very unique um, methodology, but works exceptionally well. So, like I said, it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. So let's move from the theory into practice. Now, um, so this is the reality of the situation. This is just a diagram of the reactor. I'm not quite sure I have to move through the slide to show you what happens. Right, so the samples are introduced right beside the core of the reactor using a control method. We use um, compressed air to blow the samples in and out where they are bombarded by that one times 10 to the 12 neutrons per centimeter squared per second. We're gonna have something to measure. Also shown here is our external rig. We sometimes use these for larger samples that require larger volumes to be analyzed, but that is not really the, the topic of the discussion today. So now let me start by thanking Mr. John Preston for this diagram. It was courtesy of him I got this. So this is the basic setup of a gamma ray detection system. I won't go over all the elements, but just to note that there's lead shielding, dealing with safety. And this is to shield the analyst from the unnecessary radiation coming off the sample, as well as to improve the detection of the sample because we are constantly bombarded by background radiation from the cosmos and even from the very building material surrounding us. Nothing to worry about. This is perfectly natural. Mankind was born into this. You'll also note that there is a dewar presence, and this is because the hyperpure germanium detector used to measure the gamma rays only functions properly at ultra low temperatures. We have ours at the um, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is minus 196 degrees Celsius. So let me run you through this basically and quickly. All right, so the incident gamma rays generates a current in the detector. In a photon detector, and the gamma rays are photons, the height of the pulse produced is proportional to the energy of the respective incoming photon. So you get the idea. So we run that signal for all the electronics that you just saw on the previous slide, and we get what we call a spectrum. Now, looking at the bottom axis, you will see that the energy increases from left to right. Remember I said the gamma rays are characteristic. If you know the gamma ray that we are measuring, you know exactly what the target nucleus is. They're, they're, it's characteristic, it comes from that. If you know how high this peak is, or how wide, as you'll see shortly, you know how much of the element is in there. So this is a zoom in on the spectrum. The peak shown earlier, are not single lines, they're not just height. They are actually Gaussian in distribution in the ideal case, that is. And it is this area that we use to determine the concentration of the element using the single shot equation. The white area is the peak area, the D. Remembering that equation that I showed very first, the single shot? Well, that's the peak area that I was discussing. So, 
Using this methodology, we analyze 55% of the periodic table at ISAMS. Theoretically, however, some 70% of the 88 naturally occurring elements can be analyzed by neutral activation analysis, depending on concentrations and so on. So shown here are the interfer interference-free detection limits. So this is the smallest quantity of these elements that we can measure, just giving you orders of magnitude here. This involves irradiating minute quantities of these elements in a very pure form and then measuring on a similar detection system that I just showed you. Now, in reality, spectra are not ideal or life interference free. So shown here are the real world detection limits of various uh, matrices. Remember, we're interested in the biosphere. So we're gonna talk about what's in soils, what is in, is in plant materials, what's in the human being, what's in animals. So I've given you examples of all of those right there. As you can see, they're quite varied. Now, to effectively track the fate of trace metals in the biosphere, analytical results have to be of the highest quality. As such, a great deal of time and effort has been put in to establishing a sophisticated system of quality control and quality assurance. In fact, during my tenure as head of the laboratory, up till 2014, the laboratory was recognized and still is as a regional and international level as a state of practice laboratory. That is pretty high. Now, how do we do this? Well, we measure reference materials. So shown here is just one of many reference materials that we measure, it's a lichen. So on the bottom axis, the x-axis, that is the certified value. So these materials are known very well. They are traceable to international laboratories. Um, on the y-axis are our values. Any values that lie on the horizontal line here are perfect. Or the diagonal line, sorry, not horizontal, my God, um, are, are, are perfect. And as you can see, we're doing pretty fine here also. We also do trend analysis. We measure the same types of SRM over a period of years and look at each of the elements in them and look at what you expect to find against what you find. Well, over a five year period for iron in this particular soil SRM or reference material, um, the expected value was 3.5%. We got 3.49. I think we don't need to say anything more about that, but just to say that we are again right on point. We also do intercomparisons with internationally recognized laboratories. We send samples to them um, for analysis. They provide the results. We compare them with our results. And again, we um, do quite fine. We also um, look at subsampling. So this is in-house now. So we, we take a look at the subsamples. Um, and we also quantify each element using different radioisotopes. This is to ensure that there is no isotopic biases, which has, has occurred before, and to ensure that each of the irradiations that we perform were done correctly by irradiating the sample more than once. Then we take part in international um, proficiency tests. Our laboratory for this one, so this is a global intercomparison, labs all around the world. The arrow indicates where we were, we were lab number 25, and as you can see, we're right in the middle always performing to the maximum. Now, just to reassure you that this is not just yesteryear, this was an intercomparison study that we took part in, in at the end of 2021. It involved the analysis of radioactive nuclides in soils, water and swipe tests. And as you can see, straight A's, we, we performed perfectly in this event. Now, so I've spoken a lot about our technical capability, but safety is paramount. Now, typical large reactors monitor effluents using sophisticated networks of gas and water samplers, constantly checking what's going out into the environment. Now, this reactor was um, sold as inherently safe, but you should always be able to say what your real situation is. So, as I said, we had begun our processes of analyzing different types of samples. But after analyzing numerous crops, I noticed an artifact in the spectrum, a peak I didn't really expect to see. At an energy 1293, not really 
This is a few to remember that from Argon, the gas. So, based on the fact that the fuel does not come into contact with the samples, the only effluent is the irradiated air when the samples are taken out of the reactor. Remember, I said we use a pneumatic system. Argon is the first most, third most abundant um, gas in the Earth's atmosphere at about just off of over 0.9%. However, based on its nuclear properties, it readily absorbs neutrons and therefore becomes activated. So we can actually detect it in the lab. Now, not having the funds to buy the sophisticated monitor, I developed a model to assess how much was being generated and how much was being released in the lab. Now, the good news is that it contributed very little, less than 1% of the exposure of the lab staff. Now, to this day, this is still one of my favorite publications. And I, I say that because it started out as a question, then a thought experiment, and then putting this all together. It took me maybe a best, best part of a year, but it was one of my most satisfying um, publications as it was accepted without correction or some typos, which for all those, those of you that publish, you know that that doesn't happen very often. So we now know how to quantify things. We now know that we do it safely. So. Here at ISENS, we continue to embrace a multidisciplinary approach, which is particularly poignant in today's closely independent and interconnected world, where it is now recognized that environmental, agricultural, nutritional, and health-related problems are increasingly shaped by the same powerful forces. Many of the unintended consequences of global development are key drivers of climate change and significant biodiversity loss as well as the emergence of new or accelerated spread of vector-borne diseases, such as chick V and zik V, and emerging zoonotic diseases, such as COVID-19, which I need to say nothing more about. So now I'll give you a snippet of the individual dots that we have been trying to connect into a line. So the various little projects that I'm, I'm going to discuss with you will one day all align. We understand where the pieces lie. We're just trying to put them together. Understanding this will, will assist us in our march towards achieving, achieving our national development goals. So how did it all start? Well, as Prof Layla said, I want to put Jamaica in a computer. We wanted to understand the entire system. So the initial research themes, which is a partnership between the university and the government of Jamaica, emphasized an integrated research program based on environmental geochemistry and its effects on the biosphere and social economic development. So our first major project was um, putting together baseline data on essential and potentially hazardous elements in the Jamaican environment. This was reported in our Geochemical Atlas of Jamaica, it was published in 1995, a couple of years after I got here wasn't actually here for the sampling campaign, but I was here for the analysis. So the initial sampling grid was an eight by eight kilometer squared, one sample every in every grid. This was repeated um, several years later at a higher resolution for central Jamaica, which will become apparent as to why a little later on. And we initially uh, mapped over 25 elements. We're now mapping up to 24. So shown here are the maps that we produced or a sampling of. Um, I put up Illumina first because you are not aware of bauxite producing nation. But you'll also note the remarkable similarity between the other um, heavy metals that are shown here, in particular um, cadmium. Um, cadmium is a well-known toxic metal and uh, I'll get into the importance of this and how it shaped the research for a few years afterwards. So when this work was first submitted for peer review publication in environmental geochemistry and health, one of the reviewers noted that everybody in Jamaica should have died by now of cadmium poisoning. So he concluded, therefore, your analytical methods must be incorrect. Now, the initial results were obtained by atomic absorption spectroscopy, spectroscopy, a very sensitive technique. Um, so the chemist amongst you will know more about this than me. 
It was also the preferred method for cadmium analysis at the time. Neutral activation was not recommended for it. What we needed was a method that could analyze at a relatively high sample throughput with good accuracy. I'm sure some of you have heard of the law of, of the instrument or Maslow's hammer. So that says simply, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you treat everything as it were a nail. So to do this, we pushed NAA by Sopor to its limits, and in doing so, published one of our method development papers in the Journal of Radioanalytical Chemistry. So today, this technique for cadmium analysis at ISEM is now a routine um, matter. We, we analyze almost everything for cadmium using this method. On it. it works very well. So we now have all the tools we need. What next? Agricultural studies, so we've looked at the geochemistry of soil. How does this relate to agriculture? So this now encompasses SDG number two, um, zero hunger, and SDG goal number 15, life on land. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we find out where all the farms are and then overlay them on our geochemical map and then go about sampling all these farms, whatever produce they were having um, or growing at the time, and taking soil samples to see if we could find any relationship between the two. Now, as an example, oh, So these are uh, this is a depiction of the maps of where the farms were, and a summary. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the clicker. A summary of some of the results that we got. Um, I've chosen to show two foods to you here, particularly because they're both grown in the ground: carrots and yams. Um, so for both food items, a range of cadmium data, as I mentioned, remember cadmium became a feature of what we were doing relative to other elements presented is remarkable. In both cases, the data span three orders of magnitude. In marked contrast to both yam and carrots of a narrow data spread for iron, zinc, copper, um, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and, and phosphorus. All elements essential to healthy plant growth. The remaining elements of interest show increased spread, but not as much as cadmium. So from this one may infer two points. Firstly, despite the varying trace elements in soils, both yam and carrots regulate the uptake of bioessential elements required for healthy plant growth. Secondly, the variability of cadmium in soils is also reflected in plants. So you're beginning to see the relationship now that we know what's in soils and we see how it interacts with it, our plant materials. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So as the study progressed and we began to consider the health impacts, we expanded our studies to include market basket sampling in an effort to develop tables of elemental composition of Jamaican food. Not just what we grew, but what people ate as well too. So we not only eat plants, of course, we do eat animals. I apologize for the vegetarians amongst you. Um, so we carried out similar research on cattle we looked at um, parts of the animal that would accumulate um, high levels of metals, these being the livers and kidneys. And again, we noted similar patterns. Those animals reared in areas with high levels of various trace metals. This was reflected within the bovine livers and kidneys, especially when we corrected for the age of the animal at slaughter. So shown on the right there is just a table of some of the results. And we will note that we started to measure fish at this time also. And which is a segue into our next section. We started looking, as I said, in more detail at the situation with fisheries, again, covering SDG number two, um, zero hunger, we, um, and SDG number 14, life below water this time. So over the years, as I said earlier, um, we have been accumulating elemental data on fish and noted that predatory fish generally had elevated levels of mercury, particularly hazardous for pregnant women and unborn children. And now had the opportunity to perform groundbreaking research on the elemental con content of the invasive lionfish. Now the initial government strategy for Jamaican waters was a campaign to consume the lionfish, stop, eat them to beat them. So based on the work that we had done, it was concluded that the lionfish appears to contribute modestly to mineral and trace element nutrition, 
while not being a significant contributor to dietary exposure of toxic elements. So, all the information gathered provided essential baseline data on the dietary intake of our population. So I've just given two examples because these are things that I mentioned or will talk about again. And we looked at the lionfish and again at, at rice also. Um, whilst in certain cases providing evidence of safety of our product for export, we export fish and yam and, and things and so on and so on. So now that you know what's in your food, how can you tell if it is going to be harmful or not? Well, one method is a target hazard quotient, which is defined as the ratio of the exposure to toxic elements um, in comparison to the reference source, which is the highest level at which no adverse health effects are expected. This equation was derived by the US EPA. Now, this work was led by two of my colleagues and senior researchers, Mr. Johan Antwon and Ms. Leslie Holfong, and it's fast becoming one of our most cited papers. So, good work, guys. There is no significant health, we found that there was no significant health risk to the consumer associated with the consumption of Jamaican grown food crops. So this actually now segues nicely into the next section, which is, um, so sorry, I, I'm not working well with this clicker, so I do apologize. So this is the target hazard health quotient. So we have the toxic elements and we discuss how much of each is in each of the products that we consume and how this impacts on health. As I said, next related is health related studies. So, this work was done in collaboration with colleagues from Basic Medical Sciences, um, Prof. Harvey Reed in particular. And some studies have shown that chromium supplements may be helpful for people with type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Now, based on this, we utilized blood samples from 50 diabetic patients and 50 controls. And we found, in general, the mean and median values are generally higher in the control population. That means those with diabetes have lower chromium in them. The difference between male diabetics from separated by sex and the control group was significant. So males did worse, apparently. So, um, like I said, I'm not a medic. I'm not going to try and go on about what the exact meaning of that is. Next, um, as I said, this technique is a multi-elemental technique. That means when you're looking for one thing, often other things turn up. So in this case, we um, identified other, other trace elements. We were able to quantify zinc, iron, and selenium. What did we notice? The difference between um, the diabetic population for zinc is very distinct and is statistically significant. The test for the control of, or diabetic control is the HbA1c long-term control. And we noted for male, for the male controls, there is a positive correlation for the HbA1c and selenium, indicating that those with higher levels of selenium had better control of their um, diabetes. Now, the next study um, that we looked at was human placenta. Now, as I said earlier, we had made note of the elevated levels in larger predatory fish. This could present a possible hazard to a fetus. As such, we took the opportunity to investigate human placenta, a readily available sample, which was generally discarded after pregnancy. This work was done in collaboration with the University Hospital, Prof. Fletcher again taking the lead there. So each patient completed a questionnaire, which included information on diet, particularly the amounts of fish consumed and the number of dental amalgams, both potential sources of mercury, a well-known neurotoxin. So the good news, approximately 79 of the measured placentas in this study were below the limit of 11.5 micrograms per kilogram. None exceeded the conservative estimate limit of 150 micrograms per kilogram at which neurodevelopmental issues begin. Again, like I said, this is a multi-elemental technique. So, and we had completed um, extensive questionnaires. We took the opportunity to take a look at other elements that presented themselves during the analysis for mercury. This was calcium and zinc, and we saw mothers that had higher levels of calcium in their placentas and zinc had a better outcome in terms of um, childbirth weight, which can have some long-term implications. But again, this is not my place to say. So, 
industry and commerce. Um, we did have a little impact here. <clears throat> so one of my favorite stories, it was the, in which we really helped out with, was the construction of the um, Falmouth Pier. It was almost halted permanently due to elevated levels of cadmium and nickel being reported in the dredging sample. So this was during the preparation for the, for the pier to be built, <coughs> which exceeded environmental limits in Norway. So these are the finances of the project. Now, initially thought to be anthropogenic after being, um, they initially thought this was anthropogenic caused by the dredging and by some man-made inputs. So we were approached by the government and asked to see what we could do. They provided um, sub-samples of the samples that they measured in Norway. We could quickly confirm that the, via our independent analysis, that their analysis was correct. However, we had more information than they did. We actually understood the geochemistry of Jamaica. Our remark was we were surprised that the levels were so low. We put a report together, which included several of our um, peer-reviewed publications, as well as copies of our um, geochemical atlas of the country, and proved to them that it was naturally occurring. The project was resumed, and the 224 million US dollar pier now exists. You all know it as Falmouth Pier, of course. We worked quite in the background, but made a major contribution here. And again, I'm sure many of you will remember the cement quality control issue with the bad cement issue in 2006, basically caused by the quality control system going out of alignment. The, um, the quality of cement being produced was not of sufficient quality. We were asked to assist in the recalibration of their system. We provided independent analysis for their samples. And again, the, the online systems were put back up and running again quite quickly. So again, having a large impact for the work that we do very well. Forensics. Now, um, I add this for one main reason. It's to exhibit how when you do something well, you can really change things. Now, this actually made international news. An entire beach being stolen, 500 truckloads, they estimated. Now, being able to analyze minute quantities of substances to a high degree of accuracy, you can tell the difference where, between where samples come from. We essentially developed elemental fingerprinting. So we took samples from the stolen beach and what we call recipient beaches, where the sand might have gone. Some of these beaches said, well, yes, we bought sand from elsewhere, but it wasn't from there. And by analyzing the samples, we were able to discern the difference. We could see where these samples matched up. And quite clearly, there were two beaches that, and I don't want to say too much more about this, that would have received sand from the stolen beach. So we were able to show that. Now, again, I say this is a forensics. It didn't start out like that, but you'll see where I'm going with it. Now, after amassing huge amounts of data, we began data mining using various statistical tools. In this case, agglomerative hierarchical cluster analysis. Now, the food, first food item we looked at was rice that was available in the supermarkets in Jamaica. Now, rice is an important product globally, particularly in Asia. And I actually presented on this work in a conference in Thailand. So putting in, just having a huge database, we performed this cluster analysis and straight out, blindly, it identified whether it was brown rice, white rice, or parboiled. It then, unbelievably, we were able to determine where the samples came from. And in a couple of cases, even cultivars. More importantly, why I say forensics now, we were able to identify a sample that was being sold as brown rice as white rice. And when we took a closer look at the sample, you could actually see that it clearly wasn't brown rice, it was um, dyed white rice. And the elemental composition proved just that. Now, I included this in this foren as, as forensics, we, we've shown up something that was wrong. And based on this, we have now used this methodology in several other cases. We've been able to use it for marijuana and in identifying provenance, as well as with coffee, cocoa, and now we're starting to look at things like honey and so on. So we, we see a future in this methodology, so long as your results are good. Now to end this section on just about analysis and what we're doing now, I chose this particular project. 
to highlight because it encompasses all the aspects of the work I have discussed thus far and connects the dots to a line. So this is the Cayman project. So ISENS was approached through, through the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, to aid in the investigation of possible arsenic poisoning and pollution of a small community in Grand Cayman. The pollution was believed to have been caused by the burning of a number of uh, burning of timber previously treated with arsenic for termite control. Um, wood was, was brought to the location as debris created by Hurricane Ivan. The wood was eventually burned and the arsenic leached from the ash and eventually made its way into the water table and eventually into the food chain. Now, as the title says, we followed the fate of arsenic from soil to the human body. Fortunately, the level of pollution did not reach the point of toxicity. However, there was a marked difference between the two populations, as you can see on the far right of this slide. You can see the huge difference between the control population and the um, control of the study area population, the, the um, people that were exposed. So you can see how we use this technique. When done well, you can follow everything you need to. So in 2014, we had the changing of the guard. I was elect selected as the third director general of ISENS. My vision was to build on what we had developed over the years and to use nuclear science and technology to help propel Jamaica to the development goals set out in its vision 2030. Fortunately, there is a 91% overlap between the SDGs and the Vision 2030 plan for Jamaica, which meant we could, and I should add, that the Vision 2030 plan for Jamaica came up before the UN's SDGs. Fortunately, this meant that we could still seek external funding for projects that satisfied both our national and international commitments at the same time, so one bird with two stones. However, this would not be my first task. After 30 years of operation, I was charged with the responsibility of converting the reactor from the use of weapons grade material to low enrichment for uranium. This essentially would be a re reboot of the facility, guaranteeing another 30 to 50 years of operation. The odds were against us, but I like a challenge and thankfully so did the team at ISENS. This plan, Took many years to put together, so I was only there, well, not only there for the execution, I was there throughout the planning phases, but was in charge during the time of the execution. So this plan was carried out over three countries, one international organization, and 35 ministries, agencies, and departments. So a lot of phone calls, lots of meetings, lots of um, coordinating to, to take into account. So, first things first, we had a mock-up reactor manufactured. We organized dry runs. They were very important as they familiarized all personnel with the equipment and the procedures and highlighted the things to look out for during the actual conversion activity and to minimize exposure times during actual operation. The facility was built in Montreal, Canada, and eventually shipped to Jamaica. So detailed calculations were performed on supercomputers at the Argon National Laboratory at the University of Chicago. Uh, Mr. Hell Dennis was essentially in, in charge of this and did a tremendous job. This was to ensure that the reactor core would not go prompt critical at any time during the sensitive operations. Now, when that happens, there is usually a huge blue flash. Blue flashes in nuclear reactors are a very, very bad thing and will usually be the last thing you see before make, meeting your maker. So no one normally tells the stories afterwards. Now, we also had to ensure that no one would ever be overexposed during the whole operation. So we calculated the fission product inventory to assess how radioactive the core would be after 31 years of operation. Now, again, Mr. Hale Dennis um, did a lot of these calculations using supercomputers and I'm proud to say that I using the old methods of 
calc with um, equations and so on. Um, came up to the same answer almost. I think we were less than three or four percent difference between what took weeks on a supercomputer to my calculations. I was pleased and reassured at the same time that we were on the right track here. Sorry, um, presentations are not coming up quite as I put them in. Um, nuclear security, as you can imagine, is taken extremely seriously. The entire operation was performed under the watchful eye of the International Atomic Energy Agency. We had 24 hour police and JDF security for the whole conversion process. So, so just shown here uh, is the use of underwater cameras to verify the integrity of the fuel. The American government would not accept it back after the fuel was damaged in any way. And we also had to tag the um, core to ensure that what we sent out was what they received. So the removal process would take approximately one week from start to finish after years of planning. Now, this was done in the dead of night with the JTF helicopter flying overhead, um, JDF and JCF military escort, and the fire brigade on full alert. All of these personnel we had personally trained. It was like being in some sort of a movie. So at about 2.30 the, the, the night in September, early September, the Corps was put on a ship and bound for the US. Savannah River to be exact. Now, post-conversion, um, doing a little assessment here. As you can see, our estimation, the calculated doses are very close to what actually took place. So our calculations are right on, right on point. Uh, the clicker is not being my friend today. Um, so we, 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 we also um, did dose estimations. I think the, the um, maximum received um, dose was only 0.84 um, millisieverts. Not sure that means too much to many of you. But just to say, we were less than five times, we were five times lower than the maximum dose we would have accepted. So we did everything safely too. Very important. So what next? On the road to the new reactor going into place. What would this involve? Well, we had many obstacles to overcome as a number of the tools we expected to get from our, the original reactor manufacturer were no longer available. We had to start from scratch. Again, a full criticality assessment being performed before the actual exercise took place. Remember, no blue flashes, key. Um, so this is the fuel arriving um, in two separate canisters to avoid any criticality accidents. Sorry about this. Um, these slides actually should have been faded in and out, but I, I guess it's a little difficult. So this is myself and Johan Antoine performing the fuel inspection of the fresh fuel. So we inspected it before it left Canada, but we also inspected it on its arrival. Again, security and safety. Um, being paramount to ensure that what we had shipped was what we received. So, the first fuel pin being put in, loading would take three patient days. Now, for the observant among you, you will note that the first criticality took place on my birthday, so that's September 30th. And by the um, 6th of October, we had a fully functioning reactor again. So this is so this is the team, and um, from left to right we have Johan, O'Shane, Janelle, Rick, Keith, Hale in the middle, um, Pat, myself, John, and Ron. So this was an outstanding example of how regional cooperation can support global efforts to minimize the civilian use of um, weapons-grade materials, whilst preserving important research capabilities. Very important we actually ended up with a better reactor. It can run for twice as long. Core life is twice as much, meaning that we can almost double our sample throughput. So quite an achievement. In addition to the local and technical engineering expertise developed, this conversion was also an outstanding example of local, local collaboration requiring efforts from numerous government ministries, agencies, and institutions. So the future. ISENS is now a mature institution in our fourth decade. 
and we've become increasingly aware that many of the challenges that Jamaica faces are shared by our Caribbean neighbours and by extension, small island developing states across the world. However, the skill sets are built up in the young scientific staff members at ISEN during the conversion has left the institution in a unique place for small island developing states. By opting to take on board a number of the key activities during the conversion has built a remarkable team of which I am very proud. Because of them, we are now in a position to build ISEN as a regional hub for the application of nuclear technology. Now to this end, my first step was the proposal for the establishment of the first multi-purpose gamma irradiation facility in the English-speaking Caribbean, which was approved by the IAEA for almost 1 million euro. The reactor project, well, as Prof. Carwood already said, was about a billion Jamaican, which we didn't pay, the IAEA and the US government, in fact. Now, this will result in the establishment of a new department at ISENS. In the short term, this facility will be integral in two major IEA technical cooperation projects that are a vital concern to the country. One is crop improvements using experimental mutagenesis. This will use gamma ray treatments to enhance the production of ginger lines resistant and or tolerant to ginger rhizome rot pathogens. Now, why is this important? Well, data from 2016 shows that the food import bill was US $841 million or almost 18% of, of all imports of Jamaica. Now, a major constraint for crop production is yield losses due to pests and diseases. These treatment could potentially reduce those losses significantly. Now, the second project is the integrated vector management approaches with the sterile insect technique component to control the Aedes aegypti mosquito as vectors of human pathogens, particularly Zika, Chick, and Dengue. Now, I'm sure you'll remember the terrible time we had in 2016 again. Um, Statin said that chikungunya affected 48% of all persons in Jamaica. An estimated loss of Jamaica J dollar, $6.6 .6 billion, or 0.51% of GDP. Now for a country that typically grows at one or 2%, a loss of 0.5 is huge. And there was a loss of potential, potential loss of 12.7 million man hours. So getting these kind of things under control is, is truly important. Now, in the medium to long term, this multi-purpose facility will not only allow the sustainable implementation of bulk projects, but will also allow the application of the technology to numerous other crops and vectors, both in Jamaica and in other countries of the region. Additionally, the introduction of gamma ray technology to other aspects of ag agriculture, such as self-life extension of seasonal crops, increased exports because of phytosanitation, and to the health sector through uh, medical equipment sterilization and improved skin graft technologies for burn victims could have profound effects on both sectors. So as the third director general, it is my intention to keep the institution focused on the application of high quality sciences, utilizing nuclear technology and allied approaches to contribute to the country's development, development agenda as directed by its Vision 2030, and to regional development through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and to the Paris Climate Agreement. In doing so, I have deliberately sought to establish the UWI and ISENS as a hub of nuclear technology for the region and for small island developing states around the world. And as evidence of this, um, and my commitment to this goal, I have helped to design and implement one interregional project, IEA project, includes 19 small island developing states around the world and one regional project um, that involves eight um, CARICOM member states that are also IEA member states, all this taking place in the last three years. Now, the work presented today was not only about me and would not be possible without the help of collaboration and great friends and colleagues over the almost 29 years that I've been here, or the 29 years that I've been here. This work is also theirs and I want them to take pride in it too. And I thank each and every one of you. Finally, let me thank my family who have given me unconditional love and support over the years. It would have been a pretty miserable journey without you all. So in finishing, what would I like you to take away from my co our conversation today? Firstly, 
we're very good at what we do and we take pride in it. Secondly, we are now focusing on our developmental issues. Thirdly, the problems we need to solve are multifaceted. They run across disciplines and faculties. Good collaborators are essential. So we don't just need only physicists and only chemists. The numerous um, skill sets are needed. Finally, I hope what you've seen, that you've seen enough today to pique some interest amongst you. And I look forward to hearing from you in the near future in the hope of fruitful collaborations to come. So with that said, I thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to my ramblings. I hope I managed to give you a brief summary of my journey to date and maybe a glimpse of the future. I now hand you back over to the floor to Dr. Earl for any questions that you may have for me. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Grant. That uh, was very interesting. And I must congratulate you on a number of things, your, your journey to where you are today, your international recognition uh, that ISENS holds, and for all of the successes that you have uh, accomplished. I. I must say that in, it was particularly interesting to learn of the research and the studies that you conducted uh, with regard to the, the, the content, the metals, the trace materials and trace elements in, in our food. And uh, where you uh, displayed, for example, the different types of uh, or, or brands of rice that are available in, in, in the market and uh, their, 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 their content. I was wondering if ISINS has any publications that are publicly available that shares uh, that, that those findings that ISINS conducts on things of that nature. Um, sure, we do. Uh, most of the things that I showed are actually parts of publications. So yes, we have um, two publications on rice. One when we um, determined how useful the agglomerative hierarchical cluster analysis was, which is a paper that I, um, like I said, uh, presented in Thailand. And we have another one on just the raw elemental content and the um, intakes on this. And I'm, I'll be glad to share those publications with anybody so concerned. Wonderful. Well, I, I think those are. Papers. Yeah, I think I think those would are. Uh, Particularly useful for for the for the public, I think at large, to know uh, which of the products are actually provide what they claim to provide, uh, what their content is, and um, the the science that would back it is also, I think, quite invaluable. Uh, right. You've, I, I must say again, you've done quite a significant amount of work. Uh, there is, I think, also a, a general perception that when you hear nuclear, you think about power generation. Uh, mm. Is there any such thing on the horizon as far as ISINs goes, or are there any partnerships that are, are being contemplated in that particular area? Sure. Um, many years ago, I think it was about 2009 or 2010, and we were asked to conduct a feasibility study, which we did. And every year now, I update this feasibility study. The big problem with the technology, and it's not really a problem, it's, it's a matter of size. Um, the types of reactor that exist today that are well tested and understood are large. They're typically one um, gigawatt of power or more. So you would have everything that the country needed, or maybe twice over, in just one reactor. That is not a sensible way to have to control a power grid. All generating machines go down from time to time, they require maintenance. So generally speaking, the rule of thumb, you should never have more than 10 or maximum 20% of your total grid capacity in any one unit. So at the moment, the size of reactors is the, the, the um, inhibiting factor for us going nuclear. Fortunately afoot, there are much developments going on now what they're calling small modular reactors. Um, we are now part of an international program for smaller countries to actually look at them. There are various technologies out there. 
and I regularly attend um, um, conferences, webinars, and so on, just on this technology to keep abreast of it. So when it does come become feasible, I don't want us to be a guinea pig, of, guinea pig, of course, to be the first one to have one installed, because they re they look very good on paper. Being good on paper is not the same as being in the real world. So I have hopes for it. The technology sounds reliable, safe, and secure. So I, I think there is a future there. And as I said, there are a couple of us at the institution, again, Mr. Dennis and myself in particular, that really try to stay abreast of all the new developments in the technology. Um, and, and the final question that I have for you, Prof uh, Grant, is we've all heard quite a lot about uh, your work at ISINS, about your work uh, with in the sciences. Is there anything else that interests Professor Charles Grant? What what else is on the horizon for you in the years to come? Personally or scientifically? <laughs> uh, well, if if you don't mind personally, but certainly scientifically. Oh, personally, I, I'm hoping to see the West Indies cricket come back to life again. Maybe harder than getting nuclear yeah. power, right? <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, we, we, oh, we, we have, um, we, we have, well, like I say, I have a really dynamic staff who I can't sing their praises enough. I think there are many new things. I mean, even in the climate, I didn't even get into all the subject matters that we, we take. We, we, we have, um, uh, climate change work going on and being headed up by Dr. Adrian Spence, I think is going to be outstanding eventually when he puts everything together. Um, th there is so much happening uh, and I am so, hopeful for the future of the institution, not just because of me, but like I said, because of all the persons that are, I work with there, they are, they, they inspire me to come into work every day, let me put it that way. They challenge me, they push, and we push and work together. So I'm hopeful for the future. And I just hope that we can integrate more of what we do into what the U UWI does, as well as the government. We, we want our work to be seen and felt in, 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 in every, um, aspect of life in Jamaica. We can make things better. We want to. So that would be my hope that um, the centre goes from strength to strength with the new, with the younger staff that are here. Uh, that that sounds that does sound very um, um, very promising. And and I I won't comment on on the West Indies cricket. Uh, I don't think that's um, that, that's a completely different conversation. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, there is a question over from a member of our audience on UE TV's website. And um, the, the, the question and the statement is, thanks very much for the nice and very informative presentation. Uh, please let me know the opportunities of NEA when compared to other methods of chemical analysis like AAS, ICP, and XRF. Okay, so I must add that we do have atomic absorption. We now have ICPMS is not installed yet. I managed to get a unit through grant funding. And we also have XRF. They are complementary. Now, the beauty of um, neutral activation analysis, there is no sample dissolution. So the chances of um, you not digesting or not capturing everything that's in your sample are, are less. and the fact that you can analyze different sample types across without having to change your digestion method. So you don't get any biasing. That's why I think in tracing the fate of trace metals using the same technique for each component of your biosphere has its advantages. So the others surely do have their advantages too. And as I said, I've insisted or ensured that those very techniques that all I mentioned are part of the arsenal that ISENS now has. So I do recognize their, their abilities. And as I said, we started out with only neutron activation analysis at first, or mainly because I think the atomic absorption for the cadmium was done at Mines and Geology. And then I developed the methodology for doing it here. So um, I do appreciate them. They are complementary, and every, there is a space for all of them. And the detection limits for, particularly for biological samples in ICPMS is unrivaled. I, I have no problem with admit, admitting that. But like I say, when your only tool was what we had, 
we made the most of it and we, we did push them to its very limits. So I hope that answers the question, I, I, I think. But we do have all the tools that were mentioned. Okay. Well, um, I think that's about all the time we have this afternoon uh, for the questions and answers. And again, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time with us this afternoon, Professor Grant. Congratulations again on attaining the rank of professor. And I'd also like to say thank you to Professor Kawa for joining us today and the time that he also spent with us. And of course, to the members of our audience uh, through UETV, Facebook, and other social platforms. We are always so pleased to have to have you here with us and to have you spend some time. Uh, I look forward to the next occasion that I'll see you, and that most likely will be when we hear at the Faculty of Science and Technology at Mona have our Professor Speaks uh, series and events. And so with that, thank you so much again for your time. Please enjoy the rest of the day and have, I hope, uh, a pleasant and restful weekend. Uh, thank you very much.